Hi, this is David from over at Simply Maya. Now this is going to be a series of short videos on the very, very basics of Maya. So if you're an existing Maya user, sorry, this one isn't going to be for you. This is probably going to bore you to tears. However, at the moment, with so many of us stuck in the house um, under quarantine, I decided to cut together a series of tutorials to help out in any way I could. There's a lot of people at the moment looking to retrain maybe, or get back into Maya after a long hiatus and find the interface and the way it works has changed quite significantly. So we're going to cover the very basics, starting with the Maya interface. Now before we start, it's important to note that Maya is kind of workspace driven. So depending on what workspace you set on, it will depend what it looks like. So if you currently have your workspace set to rendering standard, for instance, it'll look completely different to mine. I would recommend if you want to follow along with this tutorial, you follow along in the Maya Classic workspace. Now the workspaces can be very useful, but generally only if you're doing something specific. In our case, we're going to be taking a look at this from the ground up. Now I'm going to start by showing you the three main ways in Maya to access the tools that you'll need to use it and also its settings. Now the first way is the menu system up here, the second way is the shelf system, and the third way would be the modeling toolkit which you can find here. This will help you with your modeling. This is the major menu set where you access pretty much everything within Maya. And this is the shelf system which allows you to set up both shortcuts to things on menus and your own personal set of custom shortcuts. Now we'll get into creating your own personal shelves like the one I have here in a different tutorial. But now it's enough to know that this is basically a icon driven shortcut system to allow you to speed up your workflow. Now talking of speaking, uh, speeding up your workflow, this menu system is driven by this drop down set here. So if I change the drop down set, the menu system itself will actually change. Now this is one of the reasons why I would recommend not getting into the habit of using the menus here. It can be a very slow and clunky process in my opinion. Now if you come down to the main viewport and hit space, you'll bring up what's called the hotbox. Now the hotbox contains all the menus up here from all these drop downs in one convenient place. So if I wanted to edit a mesh, I can go to the edit mesh menu. And if I wanted to add an end cloth, which is a Maya dynamic component, I can go to end cloth here, as opposed to going to edit mesh, then changing this menu to effects, and then finding end cloth and going to end cloth here. Now, this is one of the biggest tips I'll give you. Get used to using the hotbox in Maya. It's essential for a speedier workflow. Okay, that said, that's your three main ways to access your commands, tools, and settings within Maya. The menu system, which is superseded in my opinion by the hotbox, the shelf system, which is your shortcuts, and the modeling toolkit, which deals with all your modeling needs. Now there are, of course, much more to the Maya uh, interface system. It's very customizable. You can do lots of things with it, but for the sake of starting out in Maya, this is going to be enough to get you started and perhaps not overwhelm you with where everything is. Now I want to talk about the viewport briefly. Now in the viewport, which is this thing here. Now the viewport that you see in front of you is actually the view from a camera. So if you imagine you're looking through a camera, this is the view we have in front of us. And by default, Maya has four cameras set up. So if we press the space bar, you'll see we have a camera pointed directly from the top, a camera pointed directly from the front, and a camera pointed directly from the side, and a camera pointed from a perspective. So in this case, it would be you holding a camera, pointing it down towards the floor, which is represented by this grid. Now this grid serves a number of functions. One of the most important being, if I turn it off, I have no orientation in 3D space whatsoever. I cannot tell whether I'm upside down, whether my camera is pointed at the floor, the ceiling or whatnot. So without the grid, it becomes very difficult to orientate yourself in 3D space. The grid also becomes very useful for measuring things. Now by default, the scale in Maya is set to centimeters. So this will be one centimeter by one centimeter. So the grid can also give you an overview of how big the things you are modeling actually are. 
Now, in Maya, scale can be very important for dynamics work. Um, throwing a, a one meter squared bucket of water, for instance, is completely different than throwing a one kilometer squared bucket of water, of course. And Maya will take scale into account for a lot of things. Now, you can change the base scale of Maya by going up to Windows, Settings, Preferences, Preferences, going to Settings, and you'll see the linear working units are set by default as centimeters. Now, I would recommend you leave this in metric if you can. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. Maya's internal scale units for a lot of its dynamics are metric based. And in fact, Maya in general is metric based. Now you can set it to inches if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. You'll just need to take that in mind, bear that into account as the stuff you're working on gets more complex. So recommended to leave it in centimeters, which is what mine is, is what, what mine is right now. Now, coming in, we need to know how to move our cameras about. So how to move our perspective around this scene. So you want to hold Alt and hit the left mouse button to rotate around the scene. Alt and the middle mouse button will pan the camera around the scene. And Alt and the right mouse button will zoom the camera in and out of the scene. And you do that by holding the button and dragging left and right. Now, this is fairly simple in operation. One thing I would note, one tip is do not use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Now, the reason for this is quite simple. All of the cameras in Maya have a history, so you can jump backwards and forwards. So let's say I have zoomed in to my object here and rotated a little bit. Now I want to go back to my previous position. Well, I can use the brackets on the keyboard for this. So that goes around and back. If I use the scroll wheel to zoom in, all of my camera history will be full of those tiny jumps, making it kind of pointless. So using the scroll wheel will actually end up destroying your own uh, camera history. So don't do it. Don't get in the habit of it. It's very tempting. I still do it myself sometimes. Um, so don't learn the bad habits that I learned. Now, you can move yourself around the viewport, you can move your camera around, you can also move the top, front and side cameras, but you can only pan and zoom them. You cannot rotate them. If we rotated one of these cameras, it would no longer be an orthographic view, it would indeed be a secondary perspective view, which is generally not what you want. So I'm going to press spacebar and go back to the main view. And now we can move ourselves around the viewport. I want to talk about how we move objects around the viewport. And in order to do this, we'll need to create something to move around, of course. So I'm going to come up, hit the hotbox, go to create polygon primitives. Now, by default, Maya on a lot of versions will have interactive creation turned on. So if we turn that on, I'll show you what happens. We'll go to create polygon primitives and we'll just do a cube. Now with interactive creation turned on, I will need to draw the cube on the graph, on the um, grid here for it to come into the scene. Now this is generally speaking, not what I want to do. In 20 years of using Maya, I've used this functionality only a handful of times. So you're gonna wanna come in and you wanna go to create uh, polygon primitives, turn off interactive creation. And the same thing will hold for NURBS. You want to turn it off for NURBS as well. And I'll get into the difference in polygons in NURBS in a later tutorial. But right now, come in and create a polygon cube. And you'll see that comes in if we look under the channel box and we look under the inputs for the polygon cube shape. You'll see it comes in a width, height and depth of one by one by one centimeter. And in fact, if we line this up on the grid here, you will see that it closely mimics or indeed exactly fits in one of these grid units. And we can more see that if we use, say, the top view. And again, this is a good reason to have these orthographic views. You'll see here in the perspective view, it's actually quite tricky to line something up into the place where you want it to go. But with the orthographic view, it becomes much, much easier. So there is a reason Maya has four viewports. Now, to move this object around, you're going to want to use this gizmo here to move it in its various different axes. And if you look down here, you'll see the Z, X and Y axes, which relate to these. So you can also see the translation of the object, the movement of the object up here in the channel box. So if I look at Z, this way is positive Z. So as I move this this way, you'll see the positive Z number increase. Anything over the center line of the grid will actually be negative Z. 
so you can see me go into negative z. The same holds true of x. If I rotate around this way, you can see the x is pointed in this direction, so this will be positive x, this will be negative x. And the same holds true of y. Anything going up will be positive, anything coming down below the center of the grid line here will be negative. Now this is quite important to understand for when you start mirroring objects and when you start modeling and getting into more complex stuff, but this is a fun fundamental concept within Maya. You can also change those values by coming up here and typing something in. So if I need a specific x and 10, there you go, that's moved our x 10 units. Exactly. So that's how you move something around. There is also a third option. You can grab this in the middle. Um, I wouldn't recommend this in the perspective view because it becomes very difficult to see where it is. However, in the orthographic views, it actually is quite useful because you can only move into axis. X and Z in this case, Y and X in this case, and Y and Z in this case. So in the orthographic views, you're fine to grab it in the middle if you need to and move it about. In the perspective view, yeah, it's just not that helpful. You have kind of really no control if you watch the translates on where you're going to put something. Now, there is ways and means around that, of course, but for now, basically, you want to master figuring out which axis is which, what's negative and positive, and where you're moving your object with some degree of control. This will serve you well later on um, when you come to model something a little bit more complex. So that's how you move something around in the viewport. Now let's talk about how you scale it. So if you hit R on the keyboard, you'll go into scale mode. And once again, you can scale in all the axes. So X, Z and Y here will scale you in all three axes. And if you hold the center, you'll scale them all at the same time. Now there's a handy trick here to be had with the scale tool. If I want to scale Z and X at the same time, but without doing this and having a guess, and I don't want to type in the number here, uh, I can actually grab the axis I don't want to scale, hit control, and then scale it. Now, at the moment, if you look at the scale under my channel box, you can see I'm only scaling Z and X. I'm not scaling Y, even though it's Y I'm actually pulling, because I have control pushed. Now, if I want to scroll Y and X, I'll go on hold Z with control hold, held, sorry, and move these up and down and you can see I'm doing my scaling there. Okay, so that's scale basically as you would imagine, same as move, really just got to get used to using the axes and you'll be fine. Now we need to talk about rotate. So if you hit E on the keyboard, you'll rotate. And again, you've got the same movement gimbal thing with the scale on any axis that you want to. Okay, so basically the same principle. Again, you can always come in here and set everything back to default, should you want to, should you need to, or if you would need, say, a precise rotation 90 degrees in X, for instance, you can do it here. And let's make that 45, because 90 will put it in the same position. You can do it here. Okay, another neat trick with the rotate tool is if you hold J and move this, you'll actually snap it into increments most handy when you're modeling and you need to flip something quickly, 90 degrees, 45 degrees and whatnot. So that's basically rotate. So now we can move ourselves around the object and we can move our object around us. And those shortcut keys again, W to move, E to rotate, R to scale, also available up here. But this is something you will be doing all the time. So memorize the hotkeys for this one. You'll save yourself a whole bunch of time and trouble. Now, there is a couple of things that I want to deal with before I leave you. And that is focusing for a start, something you'll also do all the time. So if your object's way over here and you don't want to zoom and pan and zoom, you can actually use F on the keyboard to focus your objects. And this, of course, will work in all of the viewports. Now, there is one last thing that I would like to leave you with for efficient Maya usage, and that's what's called the outliner. Now, I never run Maya without this particular window open. So if we go up to Windows Outliner, you will see here this contains everything in my Maya scene, and I can actually dock it to the interface here. And for me, I would never use Maya without this thing permanently open. Now, what the outliner does is it lists all the items in my scene. So the four cameras that we have 
plus the one cube that we have. This means that if I've lost my object off the screen somewhere, at its simplest, I can select it here and hit F, and that will focus in to my object. So this becomes extremely useful for keeping track of the things that you have within your Maya scene. Now, it has more utility than this. It allows you to rename things, so like so. And this becomes quite essential, especially if you're working in a team. If you have multiple objects in your scene, so let's just create a cylinder here, and let's say a ball, and you've turned these into three different models. If you give someone a scene that just says cylinder 684, cube 21, square 59, and they have to texture it or animate it, it becomes very difficult for them, and you'll get angry memos, basically. So it's important not only to keep a clean outliner for yourself, because you will become confused if you just have a series of polygon boxes as to what's what. It's important to keep it from a team perspective as well, because you rarely work in Maya at an industry level on your own. Now, that said, it's useful for you as well, because if you've lost a couple of these things and you can't find them, you know, you're looking around all over the place. Now, obviously, our scene is very small, but as it gets bigger and more complicated, I might need to find my cylinder by clicking on it in the outliner and hitting F, and now I can find my cylinder. I can jump to my square, and I can jump to my cube. And, of course, this works in the four views also. So the outliner in Maya is an essential piece of equipment, um, not only for these reasons, but if you wanted to edit the attributes of your cylinder, you know, you can come up here and edit the attributes of your cylinder, both with the attribute editor and the channel box, without actually having to physically click on it within the viewport. Okay, so I hope you've taken something of interest away from here. I hope I didn't bore you to tears. This video, I know, has been a lot of me talking. But these are some of the basic foundations which you will need to build on any work within Maya. So I'll be back in another series and another video to teach you some more about Maya. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I hope it's been of some use. Uh, stay safe, stay in the house and all that, and I shall see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.